We're facing the greatest evil the world has ever known. We're gonna need a team. How are we gonna pull this off? Figure it out over a drink? Probably best. My name is Brett Sinclair, executive pastor here at Covenant Grove, and I'm not preaching today. But I'm going to take you back in time. We're going to take you back to Christmas Eve service. Those of you who were here Christmas Eve, you remember that? All four of the pastoral staff up here in sync with a sermon. Different perspective on what was going on at the time. So you've seen us preach from time to time throughout the year, except one of us. One of us you haven't seen preach quite yet, and that's Jill McDaniel, our media minister. Well, we keep Jill, and she does. She spends her time in caves, I believe, right? <laughs> Do you all know what a cave is, right? This is our cave back here, right? And that's where Jill spends a lot of her time masterminding all of the, the brains of the operation of what we do here. So that you may know. What you may not know are some things that I'm getting ready to share. So this is get to know Jill, fact or fiction. Are we going to have this on the screen? Fact or fiction. Born, raised, and lived within five miles of the present location of Covenant Grove. Fact or fiction. Actually, it's 5.5 miles. Okay. All right, married to Blake, has one teenager and one almost teenager. We good with that fact? Yes, fact, okay. A generation Xer. So there's a millennial voice in the crowd and they know each other, so. She is in fact a millennial, all right. Passionate about Jesus and about cheese. Fact or fiction? All right, we'll go with that. Okay. Uh, cannot stand eating onions. Very disappointed. That is a fact. Did you know? Okay, Blake, uh, never been to Spain, never been to Oklahoma. Never been to Spain. Okay. Fact or fiction? That's, that's a fact. They've never been to Spain. She's never been to Spain or Oklahoma. Okay, did you know Blake and Jill were one of the three couples in the original prayer group that emerged in what is now Covenant Grove? How about that? That is a fact. All right. And just completed a road trip through seven states with her extended family. That is a fact. So now you know a little bit more about Jill McDaniel, media minister. Could you please put your hands together and welcome her up? Okay, there we go. As somebody who does spend their time in what we call, jokingly call the cave uh, running sound, I told myself, okay, the one thing you can't do today is not turn on your mic. And I went to turn on my mic and it was already on. So I did turn on my mic. <laughs> all right, good morning, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Um, yes, my name is Jill McDaniel. I am the media minister. And since you haven't heard a message from me like this, I am on stage from time to time, but this is my first time giving a, I don't know, a, a full feature length sermon, full length feature sermon, what, whatever order that's supposed to go in. Um, Brent did a great job of introducing me. I'm going to give you a little bit more info on me. Uh, I am married. My husband and I are going to be celebrating our 18th anniversary this year in a couple of months here. Uh, we do have two kids. We have a 12-year-old and an almost 15-year-old. Um, we have two pets. We have a dog who is not handling the heat well because he's not getting to go on all the walks. And so he's just like, what is going on, you guys? We're not going outside. And no, we're not going outside. <laughs> and we also have a gecko and he's way more low maintenance. I recommend them. <laughs> uh, going back even further than that, I did grow up going to church as a kid um, from very early. So I got the early faith foundation that church kids get of uh, learning things like 
morning quiet time. And okay, kids, we're going to fold our hands and bow our heads and close our eyes. It's time to pray and doing weekly memory verses and things like that. Um, That was my early church life. And I did eventually get involved in serving as time went on. Um, But God actually put a desire to be involved in church planting in my heart at a younger age, uh, younger than maybe my uh, parents were expecting. (laughs) Um, When I was in maybe fifth grade, around age 10, I probably should have confirmed with my parents when that was because they're here so they can let me know. (laughs) But um, the church that I grew up at felt called to plant a church. And I thought that sounded like the best thing ever. I wanted to go be part of that church, and I thought it was super exciting, and I was like, yes, God is speaking to me. But I was 10. We are going to be talking about honor today, but this is the only point of the message where I'm going to reference Exodus 20, where it says, honor your father and mother when you're 10 years old, and God gives you a message, but it is not a call for your whole family. You got to go with what your family says, right? Right? So I did not get involved with church planting at age 10, but the, uh, the heart for it was there. Uh, fast forward a number of years, I'm married at this point and still going to the same church with my husband, and they felt led to plant again. So at that point, my husband and I prayed about that and felt lo- led to join that prayer team and eventually the launch team, and we eventually became part of Covenant Grove. So that has been my journey, and I will say, if you've never considered it before, church planting is a growth experience, (laughs) and we were very young when we planted Covenant Grove, Um, so it was actually really foundational for us as young adults, and as newly married, and then as young parents. Um, It really formed how we lived all of that and how we did all of our faith. And I can confidently say from the Lord, I probably would not be living out my faith in the way that I do now had we not been involved with church planting. And I probably would not be on a stage ready to bring you all a word from the Lord this morning. (laughs) So um, yeah, church planting was a very hard but a very great, uh, wonderful experience for us. I'm really excited to be jumping in during our God at the Movies series. Um, This is something that Covenant Grove started doing pretty early on. And in the beginning, I didn't quite get it. I was like, what is God at the Movies? What? Like, um, Bible, please. (laughs) Well, um, since then, uh, once I, you know, figured out, okay, this is what we're doing. um, It's been something that I've really enjoyed every time we do it because it, The messages are never on the movie, they're on the Bible, so they are accessible to everybody. And continuing that accessible to everybody, I really appreciate that we're talking about themes from a movie, but I don't have to see the movie if I don't want to. Um, I'm over extended series of movies, so if we're doing a sermon on Toy Story 15 or whatnot, I'm probably not going to watch the movie, but I will be there for the message on Sunday. But I love how invitational this message series is. For me, it's such an easy invitation. Hey, yeah, at my church, we're watching movies together. And then we're talking about them afterward. You want to come join us? Maybe come hang out with me, have some food, watch a movie. And then let's hear what the Bible has to say about themes that we heard in that. So I love the God in the Movies series. It's one of my favorites that we do every year. So I'm really excited to be here for this series today. And that was also uh, permission for you guys to not be into the movie that I felt God chose for me to give you a message on. It's okay, I understand. Um, But let's talk about the movie real real quick. All right, I'm talking about Dungeons and Dragons, the most recent Dungeons and Dragons movie, Honor Among Thieves. And yes, most recent because this is actually the fourth movie on the, kind of based loosely on the Dungeons and Dragons tabletop role-playing game, which is kind of hard to say, which is why most of the gamers say TTRPG. (laughs) Um, And I will say from the get-go, I am not a D&D player. I have never played. I had no interest in playing. But I was able to really enjoy this movie. I loved it a lot, and I saw a lot of great themes and messaging in it. And in fact, I saw so many themes that um, I kind of outlined like an eight-week sermon series instead of a sermon. (laughs) So um, it was kind of hard to boil all that down into one single message. So we're we're here now. We've got one message on this. Um, The 
Um, so just some quick stats about the movie. It did come out last year in 2023. Uh, it had a budget of 150 million worldwide. Box office only reached at 208, and in the United States, they only hit 93 million. So not great margins for Hollywood. If you have any idea about how that works. Um, unfortunately for the movie, there was some drama around the time of its release because that was actually between the players and consumers of D&D the game and the game production company. So there was talk of boycotting and why are you doing a movie when you're doing this stuff that we don't like. So it did not do very well, but it still received 20 award nominations and won three awards. One of the awards was most underrated movie of 2023. <laughs> so... Um, and it did receive high critical acclaim. Um, I don't use Rotten Tomatoes very much because they don't tend to like the kind of uh, fluffy movies that I like. They get low ratings. But this one actually received a 91% on Rotten Tomatoes. And as far as I can tell, that's actually pretty high for that partic particular critic review um, website. All right, let's talk some themes in the movie. I'm not even going to give you all of the ones that I found. We're just going to look at a few of them. <laughs> all right. We're, the, we see throughout the whole thing the power of creativity on a very meta level. It's a movie, creative, imaginative endeavor all together, everybody involved, based on a game that takes imagination and creativity to play. So we've got levels of creativity there. Relationships. I almost said human relationships, but it is fantasy, so they're not all human. So... We'll just go with interpersonal relationships. Um, teamwork. We do see messages on honor and justice, but also lying and manipulation. Um, we see failure and how do we respond to failure. There's a great line later in the movie from the main protagonist that is, we must never stop failing because the moment we do, we failed. That may not be original to the movie, but as far as I can tell, if you give Chris Pine a line to deliver with passion, you're going to get a strong delivery every time. He did a great job. So, and then we also see throughout the whole thing um, grief and guilt and how those can be tied together. All right, so a little bit on D&D the game real quick. Um, the big idea, and I did confirm this with those who do play since I don't, <laughs> is working together as a team. You have a team that you work together with and you um, travel and whatever you're doing, whether it's fighting monsters or saving the town or just searching for treasure, your goal is to save the day. We all want to save the day, right? Even if we're not playing role playing games, we want to save the day. We want to save somebody's day, at least ours. And then we see that in the description of this movie. A charming thief and a band of unlikely adventurers embark on an epic quest to retrieve a long-lost relic, but their charming adventure goes dangerously awry when they run afoul of the wrong people. Has anybody ever been part of a group project that maybe didn't go the way it was supposed to go. I think you can maybe relate to that. <laughs> um, they are a team of adventurers. They've been working together for a while. Um, and if you're working as a team or working together with people, you need something to rally around, a unifying factor. So what does this team have? Um, they are all thieves. Probably not something that's going to hold them together for very long. You don't necessarily need lots of people for that. And you, you know, if you start competing with one another, you're not going to stick together probably. Um, they've worked together for a few years. Uh, but as we know from our own lives, just because you go through a season of life together with people doesn't necessarily mean that's going to continue on into the future. You know, maybe you guys drift apart. Maybe things don't go very well and you lose touch. Um, but these are not things that are going to bind people together. And the main goal of the team throughout this movie is one held by one person. One person on the team wants all of them to work together to acquire one thing. And he's not upfront and honest about his motivation for acquiring that. And from the beginning, we see that the team is off. There are too many players on the team who are working for their own goals that are counter to the rest of the team goals. 
And it only takes one selfish decision or action to derail even the best laid plans, right? And the movie tagline is, who needs heroes when you have thieves? But the movie title is Honor Among Thieves. And I don't, I mean, I mean, maybe it's just me, but to me, the concept of being a thief or thievery does not really go with the concept of honor. Like, what, what is honor? What does that mean? So let's look at the word honor real quick. It can actually be a noun or a verb. Um, if we look at it as a noun, it means high respect or great esteem. So we're awarding you this honor or adherence to what is right or to a conventional standard of conduct. As a verb, um, it is regard with great respect, so hold someone with, in high honor, or fulfill an obligation or keep an agreement. Um, there's room in your notes, if you're following along in the bulletin, for you to leave some thoughts. My thoughts on what honor means. Honor is things like honor, respect, integrity, understanding of each other, um, holding each other in high regard and accountability. It is not manipulative, self-focused, having an angle or an end goal. It's not canceling somebody just because they didn't live up to my expectations or do something in the way that I wanted it to be done. Those are not honor. And the biggest thing that I saw underpinning everything in this movie was manipulation of people or circumstances for personal gain. Um, the, lead, the movie opens with the lead character doing some manipulative storytelling. Um, that's how the exposition begins in this movie. Uh, I already told you that throughout the movie, he has this one goal. He wants to get this one thing, uh, but he's not upfront about his motivation. So he's manipulating and being dishonest with the team about why he's doing this. Uh, he has a young daughter who he doesn't even really tell about what they're doing. And so all of that comes back to bite him with both the team that he's working with and his daughter. He has not been treating them with respect or with honor, and it comes back and hurts him. He's been working for his own personal goal, trying to make that a team goal, and that's not gonna hold people together. And the, because it's a team, there's multiple people, um, and they all have their own goals, but two of them in particular are working counter to the team throughout the whole thing. Uh, we have Mr. Shady, that's not his name, but I'm calling him Mr. Shady, <laughs> um, and his goal is wealth, treasure, glamour, whatever, you know, things that make him look great, but it's mostly about treasure. He wants wealth, so he's going to do whatever he can to get it, including conspire with the danger lady of the team who has her own goals. She manipulates his manipulative behavior to achieve her goal of ending the world as they know it. So throughout, they are foiling plan after plan after plan that the main team is trying to accomplish by trying to achieve their own personal goals. All right. We've got layers of creativity, but we didn't talk a whole lot about that. Layers of manipulation and dishonesty. Um, throughout all of that manipulation and whatnot, we have no adherence to what is right or to a conventional standard of conduct. So no honor. We have no fulfilling obligations or creep keeping agreements. Yeah, I'm going to help you with that thing, but really I'm going to do my own thing. So again, no honor. They are all working together toward a goal, but each of their goals is themselves not great for a team environment, right? None of them are putting the same goal first because they're putting themselves first. So where in all of this is the honor? And when are we getting to the Bible? <laughs> we're going to do that right now, but we're actually going to pray before we get into God's word, okay? Dear Lord, I thank you for um, all of the tools that you have given us so that we can view the media that we consume every day um, through the healthy lens that you build within us um, and not be pulled different directions by different messaging from the world around us. I pray that your words are made clear today in this place and that your message is what is most clear. 
In your name, Lord. Amen. Okay. So I'm going to have you open your Bibles right now to Luke 22. Um, If you don't have a Bible, there are some in the chairs in front of you. If you don't own your own Bible, we actually have free Bibles available out here at our info and resources table. So please grab one of those if you don't have your own, because we'd love for you to have one. Uh, One last thing on the movie. Um, We talked about D&D being about saving the day, but in the movie, the big and small save the day moments that they're working towards don't come until they put aside all their personal motivations and work for others first. So until they're actually being honorable, they cannot save the day. We're going to hear some of this echoed in the scripture that we're looking at today. Um, In the Gospels, all four of the Gospels, we read about Jesus calling the 12, the 12 disciples, and they then spend three years together walking everywhere, which does not sound like a good time to me, especially when it's this hot outside in California. I don't want to walk anywhere. Sorry to my dog. But um, they spend all their time together almost, and they are watching uh, Jesus teach and perform miracles and break religious and cultural traditions. Yes? Because he knows what his end goal is. And he's trying to teach them along the way how to live that goal of God's purpose on earth and putting God before everything. Um, If you haven't read the Bible very much or spent much time in the Word, I encourage you to read the Gospels. Check out how Jesus moved on his path to this destination. So we're going to start today in Luke 22, 1 through 6, with Judas, uh, one of the adventure uh, people. Um, In verse 1, the festival of unleavened bread, which is also called Passover, was approaching. The leading priests and teachers of religious law were plotting how to kill Jesus. They have a unified goal. You pick up on, they have a unified goal. Uh, But they were afraid of the people's reaction. Then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, who was one of the 12 disciples, and he went to the leading priests and captains of the temple guard to discuss the best way to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted, and they promised to give him money. So he agreed and began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus so they could arrest him when the crowds weren't around. So like I said, Judas is one of those original 12. He was called three years prior to this. He spent almost every waking moment together with Jesus, learning from him, hearing him teach, seeing the way Jesus lived out his own devotion to the Lord, And yet, even after three years, he still had his own expectations, his own idea of what the Messiah should be, and Jesus was not living up to that. He wasn't trying to achieve Judas's goal, so he didn't like that. So he went to the religious leaders. Hey, uh, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. I will betray Jesus to you, and then they would give him money. So in that moment, he is not honoring the Lord, right? Um, But he's conspiring with another group to manipulate a situation and ends up playing into the machinations of others. Does this sound like something we already talked about? So this is our Mr. Shady today. (laughs) Um, Someone who, the situation's not going the way he wants, so he's going to go make it happen in a different way. And it ends up leading to his destruction. Uh, If you keep scrolling in Luke 22, verses 7 through 20, Jesus, during the Passover meal, establishes the new covenant, uh, which we're actually going to be commemorating today, later in the service. We're going to do communion. But the people there in that room, the 12 disciples, they were Jewish men. They had been doing Passover together every year, year in and year out. So they knew what all the meaning of the different parts of the Passover meal were about. And when Jesus said, this is the new cup, the new covenant in my blood between God and his people, they should know what that means. This is a big moment in Jewish history. And yet, when Jesus says, one among you is the man who will betray me, in verse 23 we read, the disciples began to ask each other which one of them would ever do such a thing. It's not me, so it must be you, right? Then they began to argue among themselves about who would be the greatest among them. 
So they're pointing at each other. It's you. You're the thief. It's you. And then they go, oh, hey, there's three figures pointing back at me. Look at me. I am the hero. I'm the best, right? Who among us is going to have the highest honor? They all have missed the message that Je Jesus has spent three years trying to teach them. He's explained it to them already with varying levels of patience, I'm sure. But in verse 25, he has to explain it to them again. Jesus told them, in this world, the kings and great men lord it over their people, yet they are called friends of the people. But among you, it will be different. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank, and the leader should be like a servant. Who is more important, the one who sits at the table or the one who serves? The one who sits at the table, of course, but not here. For I am among you as one who serves. You have stayed with me in my time of trial, and just as my Father has granted me a kingdom, I now grant you the right to eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, and you will sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So he has to explain to them again, it's not about you getting the honor. It's not about you being elevated to a high place. It is about thinking of yourself as lower, teaching others to put God first, because you have learned how to put God first. Be a servant. Don't try to elevate yourself because all honor belongs to the Father. As we continue on, verses 31 to 34, Jesus tells Peter that he's going to deny Jesus, which, ouch, not a very honorable thing to do, right? Uh, Peter denies that he will do what Jesus just said. And then in 54 to 62, we read about Peter doing exactly what Jesus just said he would. Um, again, we have a man who spent three years learning from Jesus. He should know when Jesus says something, it comes to pass. And yet still, Jesus said that you're going to do something that's, you know, not a great behavior. And he says, nah, -uh, not me. I would never. Have you ever tried to say that to God? I have. <laughs> And then um, in Luke 22, verse 42, we get a prime example from Jesus of the way we should be living. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering away from me. Yet, I want your will to be done, not mine. Throughout his time on earth, in this darkest moment where he knows just how awful things are about to become, he sticks to one goal, the hardest goal, but he sticks to putting God's goals first and honoring God first, his will above his own. In chapter 23, we continue along with Jesus' journey to the cross after his arrest um, and his trials, and we're going to look at verse 32. Two others, both criminals, were led out to be executed with him. When they came to a place called the skull, they nailed him to the cross. And the criminals were also crucified, one on his right and one on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, forgive the crowd, for they don't know what they are doing. The soldiers gambled for his clothes by throwing dice. The crowd watched and the leaders scoffed. He saved others, they said. Let him save himself if he is really God's Messiah or the chosen one. The soldiers mocked him, too, by offering him a drink of sour wine. They called out to him, If you were the king of J the Jews, save yourself. And a sign was fastened above him with these words, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals hanging beside him scoffed. So you're the Messiah, are you? Prove it by saving yourself. And us, too, while you're at it. But the other criminal protested, don't you fear God even when you have been sentenced to die? We deserve to die for our crimes, but this man hasn't done anything wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus replied, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. We started out looking at Judas, who walked with Jesus for three years. They spent all their time together, and he missed it. He missed it so bad, and he felt like he missed it so bad that he continued to miss Jesus' message. 
and he didn't try to go back for forgiveness, and he paid for all of that with his life. We looked at Peter, who also walked with Jesus for three years, and he missed it, but he went back to the Lord. He knew he had done wrong, and he, but he received forgiveness, and he moved forward in life, putting God first. But um, as these two men walked with Jesus for three years, missed the message of Jesus, even after spending all their time together, hearing from him day in and day out, the criminal being crucified, being right next to Jesus, got it in that one moment. You are higher than I am. I am a lowly criminal. You are higher than I am. You don't deserve to be here. I do. Remember me. In our darkest moments, those can be some of the times of the most danger. Who in these dark moments that we've looked at um, today were acting the most honorably? It would have been the one who gave Jesus the highest honor. So going back to the apostles, we've been talking about teamwork. Um, I mentioned that if you're working together as a team, you need unifying factors holding you together. Um, unfortunately for the apostles, they kept missing it. Three years of missing it, and then a little more after that. <laughs> it isn't until they come to the full realization of who Jesus is and what his purpose was in coming here to earth, the salvation of all of us, that they are able to work together continue on in the work that Jesus put before them. The unifying factor of all being misfits of society, of walking through this season of life together so closely, those weren't really things that were going to hold them together for a while. Maybe they'd write to each other in 10 years, hey, how's it going? How's it been since high school? I mean, since Jesus. But you're not going to continue in those strong bonds that you've built without something more holding them together. What is it then that unifies us? What is it that binds all of us together? Because I am not the same as you, and you are not the same as this person over here. So what is it? How are we all even able to sit together? The unity that we can experience in life can only come from keeping God first. A uh, per personal story going back to um, my early faith journey. When I, I did all the, the church kid things when I was little. I accepted Jesus into my heart, and I did the, you know, fold your hands, back your hands, and close your eyes. And um, I learned about morning quiet time, but I was never very good at it. Uh, I knew what the Bible said, but I didn't always do it. Uh, and then my senior year of high school, I went to a winter camp. Um, with my youth group yet again, and I heard a message from our youth pastor at the time on leading double, double lives. And, oh boy, <laughs> did the Holy Spirit have a word for me in that moment, because I had been living as one person at school, and one person at home, and another person at church, and if I was doing other stuff, I was probably being somebody different there too. And there's no way to work as a team within yourself. You have to be one fully realized individual who then works as teams with other people. Um, I do want to add a caveat there. I'm not talking about things like dissociative identity disorder. I fully understand the reality of that. I'm just talking about um, for um, other individuals as you're living your regular life, but you're being one person here and a different person there and behaving in different ways. Um, you can't live for one goal that way, or at least not one healthy goal. The goal that I would say I was living for at that point was uh, the feedback of other people. That's not sustainable. How long is it before um, this unhealth from here spills over into here and I get in trouble? or the health from here spills over into this unhealthy area, and now I'm being shunned by the people who I was living for the feedback of. Who am I now if they, if they don't like me because I showed some health in my life? So I had to choose in that moment. Am I going to live one life fully for God, or am I going to live fully for myself? I could continue living as different people, but again, like I said, I'm lead, living for the feedback of others, which means I wasn't really living for myself. I was living for them. 
And I made the decision at that point to turn fully to Christ. Not because I wanted to be a hero, not because I wanted to save the day, but because I had been testing the waters and I had seen just how harmful that was. Following God's directions did not lead me to self-inflicted danger, so I did not want to miss what he had for my life because I was too busy chasing other people or chasing other things. I can be fully myself when I honor God above all other things. Um, holding God highest means that I work to keep his goals my focus, and any goals that I make for myself or with others have to be in alignment with his mission. Choosing to follow God and keep his goal first means that I choose to be in community with other believers and followers of Jesus, and I trust that as long as we are all making that decision to put God first, and we have the power of the Spirit living in us, helping us in our daily decisions and walking with us, that is the unifying factor that means that we can all work together, no matter how different we are. But I do know that putting God first is not a one-time decision. Like I said, that was my senior year of high school, and I just told you I had been married for almost 18 years, so that was a while ago. Um, putting God first is multiple decisions. It's daily decisions. It's often moment-to-moment -moment decisions. It takes habit building and discipline. It takes time. None of those things are my favorite. I have ADHD. I don't do habits. I don't really co comprehend time the way other people do. Um, so discipline is um, not something that comes easy to me. I know that um, we're going to fall back. If you've been walking with the Lord for a while, you probably have experienced that yourself. We fall down from time to time. But, and I think that, that you know, occasional failure is why I like the line from the movie so much. Of the moment we give up on failing is when we fail. Because no matter how many times I fall down, I know that I have the promises of God. And he's told me that as long as I get back up and keep going with him, he is faithful to continue walking with me. And I have to be careful because, um, like I said, I was testing the water, so sometimes I still catch myself doing that kind of thing, and I know that any time I hear myself saying something like, oh, that's not who I am, or that doesn't fit me, or that's not really my thing when I'm talking about something that comes from the Bible, I know who's in the wrong. If I say I don't like karaoke and I will not do it, that's not in the Bible, that's okay. But if it's in the Bible, if it's in God's Word, and I say, oh, that's not for me, I'm not putting God first. I'm not giving him the highest honor. So how do we make sure that we're putting God first? It's the same at the beginning and at the middle and at the end. Giving God your first and your best. Prayer, being in the word, and being part of a community of faith. These are all foundational for your personal walk with Christ. And you learn to do these things so that you can be that person putting God first so that you can work with other people in his community. Um, I've already told you about some of my early faith foundation. Um, none of that carried over to adulthood for me. <laughs> so what does it look like for us as adults or soon to be adults if we have younger people here in the room who aren't adults yet? Um, how have you learned to live out your faith and put God first? Because my faith could not be my parents' faith. My faith can't be your faith. It has to be mine. Um, I mentioned morning quiet time. I, uh, do we have morning people in here? I mean, you were all here at the 9 a.m. service, so my mom is a morning person. <laughs> We've got a few, okay. Um, I am not a morning person, uh, but I do know that the Lord tells us to give us his first, or to, for us to give him our first and our best, so I give him my first, I spend the first part of my day with him, but that is not my best, so I also give him my best time of day. Um, that can change from one season to another, but for me, that's generally around 9 p.m. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm giving the Lord the first part of my day, and I do have kids, and if you've had young kids, you know that morning quiet time is not really easy to maintain, so I generally have morning time with God. 
it's not quiet time, but it's morning time, and it's my, the first time of my day, and that sets the foundation for the rest of it. Um, with prayer, we teach people to pray by closing their eyes. Whether they're a kid or an adult, we do talk about that, and it is great because we're teaching um, each other to close out any visual distraction so that we can focus on God. But that doesn't work the same way for everybody. <laughs> For me, um, I, it's not just that I can't hold still well or I don't sit still well. Um, when I close my eyes, I actually feel a sensation of movement in my head. So when I, if I try to close my eyes when I pray, I feel like I'm tipping over or about to fall. Um, that can be nauseating and not conducive to good conversation with the Lord. Um, so the best way for me to be in prayer is on the move. I love going on prayer walks. I incorporate prayer with daily stretch routines. Um, like I said, it's hot. I'm not going on outside prayer walks right now, but I will pace in my apartment. Um, and uh, I, I just, I know that I need to be having those conversations with the Lord, so I make sure that I do it on the go. A uh, churchy phrase that we like to use is go to God in prayer. I like to go with God in prayer. <laughs> um so think about what maybe your next steps would be in prayer. Maybe you've been trying to sit still and be meditative when you're praying and you're just, it's not working for you because you're thinking about, oh, I need to move the laundry and oh, did I make that appointment like I thought I did or do I still need to do that? And does anybody else smell that? What is that? Maybe you need to get on the move with God and go on a prayer walk. Maybe for you, um, saying prayers isn't very helpful for you, so maybe you need to write them down. You need to write out what you want to communicate with the Lord. Try different things and find what fits where you are in your faith journey right now. Uh, being in the Word. Um, one, uh, something else for me is that I stink at reading nonfiction, <laughs> which is what I believe the Bible to be. I believe it is the living Word of God, which means it is not fiction. Um, so how can I stand up here and say, read the Bible when it's hard for me? because I'm giving God my first and my best, all of that energy that it takes for me to read nonfiction goes to the Bible first. And anything that I have left over goes to other things for learning new things or um, checking out history or that sort of thing. God's word comes first. Um, and in the word, that is where we learn who God is. Who am I saying we need to put first and honor in the highest? Be in the word so that we're learning who that is. Um, and working and living together, being in community. God himself works together. We saw Jesus' example in the Gospels of working together in different sized groups, whether it was his small core group, his larger group of apostles, the larger group of disciples, the crowds. He was always with people. He did also live out the example of time with just him and his heavenly father, but overall he was with others. We are made to be together. So good job, guys. You're all here today. That means you're already doing step one, right? You're being together with other believers, um, and hopefully you're learning um, and you're getting ready to take your next steps. Uh, another way that we do that, um, you've heard a few of these mentioned already this morning, are life groups. We are a life groups church, but it's summer, so they're on break. So right now we have workshops. Sign up for a workshop. Maybe you heard something today that made you go, I don't really know how to put hold God the highest. Maybe sign up for the Finding Your Purpose workshop and hear what the Lord has for you in that. Um, we also have teams. Um, a big secret here, here that's not actually a secret because I tell everybody <laughs> I did grow up serving, but it was usually with young kids or in music. Uh, and here, that's not where I am. I'm in, as Brent said, I'm in the cave running sound. And uh, the, like I said, the big, not a secret secret on my team is that Jill and technology do not get along. I don't like computers. I don't get along with electronics. Even just this morning, I was having a hard time with my tablet, and I didn't want to have a big old computer up here. We don't get along. But God has given me the ability to work with it. He's put people in my life that I can go to if I need help or training. Um, I have two team members right now who work in IT in some way. Why in the world would they want to serve with me? Because God is what unifies us. 
God has taught me over the years how to put him first and to help others to do that. So we keep him first and we work collaboratively as a team to keep focused on his mission so that we can keep this ministry going forward together in a way that's sustainable over longer periods of time. So being in the word, in prayer, being together, learning to give God our first and best, those are first steps, next steps, and final steps in your journey. The last thing that we hear the criminal on the cross doing in his life is talking to God. Jesus, remember me when you get to your kingdom. And in that moment, his prayer was answered. So no matter where you are in your faith journey, whether you're new to all of this or you've been walking with the Lord for a while and you're tired about hearing about prayer and be in the word, these are next steps for all of us. What, what, um, what next steps can you take? We talked about some for prayer, like maybe going on a walk or journaling. Um, maybe you, your next steps is actually in togetherness. Maybe you've been at Covenant Grove for a while and you haven't been in a life group. Talk to Pastor Serena, get connected to a life group or a workshop. Uh, maybe you haven't joined a team. All of our teams need people right now. We've got a whole list of teams that you can see out in the foyer and you can check those out. Can you bake or stir fry? <laughs> you can join hospitality. Um, do you just really love when you see a kid's face light up because they got something? Talk to Pastor Rachel. Maybe it's the little kids. Maybe it's not the little kids and little kids are scary. Maybe you want to talk to her about uh, helping with the youth. Um, media and Vitality are great teams uh, where we do things that go unseen. So if you don't want to be in front of people, <laughs> those are maybe a good place for you. Um, but putting God first means setting aside our personal desires, setting aside the way we were raised. Whatever it is that's holding us back, we have to set that aside. Don't miss it. Don't be the Judas who misses it and gives up for infinity. Don't, maybe you're a Peter who missed it at some point, but good news, you're still alive. There is still time to come back to God and find out, hey, God, what is my next step that you want me to take right now? Whatever God's putting in your heart right now, that is your next step. I encourage you to put him first and honor him and take that next step. God wants to save your day, and he wants you to save someone else's day. And the only way that we can hit that save the day moment is when we put him in the highest place of honor and put everything selfish aside and keep him first. All right, let's pray, guys. Lord, we thank you so, so much for the different ways that you have created each person who is here today, who is listening online. Thank you that you are the glue that can hold us all together. We know that you are unchanging, so no matter what we're going through, how different we are, we can live together as long as we put you first. I pray that we each take whatever that next step is um, in keeping you first, and we walk forward with you. In your name, Lord, amen. All right, next week we're going to be looking at the movie Signs. So we're going to watch a little preview of that right now. Ground forces are being assembled. It's happening. Don't be afraid. It's like War of the Worlds. I believe it's going to pass. Don't be afraid. They're in the house. Here it comes. Don't be afraid.